Let's talk about data visualization so that we can avoid problems like this, which is where we've got some kind of graph. Who knows what it means? Loads and loads of lines, none of them labeled. I, mean, I think the thick one is more important. That's, that's what I've learned from this. Data visualization is another method we can use, along with statistics, to have a look at our data, explore our data, and try and work out what's going on. It's a way of trying to understand our data better so that we can then perform you know, more rigorous statistical tests or actually start to draw conclusions or model our data. Right? It's a very important tool, but you've got to use it properly. You can't just plot anything and everything. Every chart you use has got to support your hypothesis or it's got to try and show the story you're trying to tell. Right? You don't just plot something because it could be plotted. There's got to be a point to it. There's a lot of problems with using inappropriate graphs and only picking subsets of your data. That's a huge problem. Right? Um, that is not just a problem for data visualization, that's a problem for your statistical tests as well. Right? If you're only using some of your data, is that okay? It's going to depend on the situation. Right? My, you know, I think there's a strong argument for saying you've got to be really, really careful and you've got to be really structured and regimented um, and document everything you do. The core problem with visualization is that people just plot stuff uh, and they do it badly. Maybe they use the in, an inappropriate plot type or they um, don't scale their axes properly, and that leads to huge misunderstandings and actually can be quite misleading. Right? This happens a lot in the media. So, for example, you might get a sort of political message through your door that says these are the different parties. So, this is party one, this is party two, this is party three, and maybe you know party one's got this many votes, and party two's got this many votes, and party three's right down here. And party two are trying to make the case that just a few more votes and they're going to win in this area. Right? But actually, written down here, this is 20,000. And this is 10,000, and this is you know, 8,000. And just in the small labeling they've got here, they've completely skewed the axis, right? 10,000 is half of 20,000, and yet here we are up here. If you misuse plots, it's actually misleading. When it's on your own data, you're gonna draw the wrong conclusions and then spend quite a while researching into an area that doesn't make sense or, and ends up in failure. Or if it's, if it's something you're presenting to someone else, you can mislead that person, whether intentionally or by accident, and that's never a good thing. I'm back in R. Um, and I just wanted to show a couple of plots that, you know, it's not misleading necessarily, but you can easily infer the wrong kind of information, right? So um, there's, there's websites online you can go to to look at the ratings for different TV shows, right? Now, one of my favourite TV shows is Frasier, right? I think it's amazing. And um, if you go onto these sites and you plot the ratings for all these Frasier episodes, it's all over the place. Sometimes it's very highly regarded and sometimes it's not. So I'm just going to plot this using the ggplot tool. And we can see, if we look at the graph, that it's absolutely everywhere, right? You've got good episodes, you've got bad episodes, and it seems to maybe be going slightly downhill towards the end, but it's difficult to say, right? Because it's all over the place. Now, what's actually happened is I've just plotted using a default function, and it's auto-scaled my rating axis, right? So my y-axis is the rating of the episodes, and it's going between seven and about nine and a half. Now that isn't representative because it's spreading out my data. If I plot the exact same data, but this time from naught to ten, like an actual rating system, you can see that most episodes get almost the exact same rating, somewhere between around seven and a half to eight, right? Which I think is pretty good. Right? I would rate them a ten, but you know, it's just me. You can see that even if you're not careful, if you do it by accident even, auto-scaling of axes and things like this can cause a real problem. Another classic example you'll see um, in the news is when they show something like a currency exchange rate. So if we look at here, we've got our, um, I've downloaded some sample data of the Japanese yen versus the US dollar. Right? And I've simplified this by extracting just a, a period of about 60 days in the middle of some time. I can't remember exactly when it is. If we plot this, you can see that actually there's a big sort of cliff edge Something terrible has happened around day 30, and the, the value of the Japanese yen is just plummeting. And of course, this is absolute nonsense, right? Because this scale goes between 108 and 114. And so if we plot it with a proper axis on, you can see that actually it's almost completely flat. If your business relies on the exchange rate of a Japanese yen to the US dollar, obviously these small changes might be important. Right? But if you're presenting this in the news, it's very easy to claim that something terrible has happened, when in fact, actually, maybe this is just normal blips up and down. Right? So, you can misuse plots to serve your purpose, right? or, and you can do it accidentally and waste a huge amount of time. Let's have a look at the, the standard plots you might see right, and you could use on a very basic level and see you know, what are they appropriate for. Because right? one of the most important things is that you use these plots and these charts appropriately. Right? So you know, perhaps the most common one that everyone sees is going to be a bar chart. You've got two axes, you've got some kind of attributes or labels down here, and then you've got some quantity or amount of some attribute here, 
and then you're going to have different bars like this. Now this is a very nice graph to use. It's simple, but it's effective because you can very easily see what the difference between these different levels are. Right? So that, you know, is often going to be your go-to graph for lots of things. Right? Some people now, some people try and replace this graph with a pie chart. Right? This is a bad idea in general. I mean, I like pie as much as the next person, but if you've got different things like this and one of them's big, I mean, you can see that this one's bigger than this one, but how much bigger it is, I don't know. You can't see the relative sizes quite so easily. This all gets worse if you combine this into a donut plot, and then you've got multiple pies embedded in each other, none of them align, and nothing makes any sense anymore. Right? So if in doubt, don't use a pie chart. It's a bad idea. I mean, they look very nice for presentations. That's about all I can say for it. If we're going to be measuring some sort of quantity, then a bar chart's going to be what we want. Right? But what we might also do is replace quantity with the, with the frequency or the amount of something so this is going to be frequency. This is also our labels again. On the bottom here, we've got our labels. This is going to be bins for some single attribute. So this is maybe so 0 to 10, and this is maybe 10 to 20 of whatever the thing is. And this is the frequency, the amount that fall into that range. And what this allows us to do is work out very easily what the distribution is. Is it normally distributed, bimodally distributed with two peaks? You know, is it skewed to the left, skewed to the right? We can see very easily the shape of our data, and this can be really helpful. Another way of looking at the sort of the shape or the range of our data in particular is a box plot. Right? Now you'll see box plots come up from time to time in scientific uh, documents, but they're, they're very easy to produce in, in tools like R and they can be quite useful. So here we're going to have a single attribute, so some label again or some attribute here, and this is going to be the quantity of this attribute. And what a box plot does is label the range of that data. So we're going to have a box here like this, and it's going to look a little bit like this. So I'll use a different color pen. This line in the center is our median, typically. And then this is going to be the third quartile here. Third quartile. And this is going to be the first quartile. And then these are the max and the min. In this one plot, we've got the absolute range of our data. We've got where 50% of our data is, sort of this interquartile range here. And we know where the midpoint of our data is. So we can very easily see whether we've got outliers. And we can plot this next to a different attribute. And we can have two box plots next to each other. And we can see very quickly you know, a comparison between these two things. So that can be really useful. Now the final ones, right, we're going to be talking about scatter plots and trend lines. Right? So a scatter plot, very simple. We've got two attributes. This is attribute one and this is attribute two. And we want to see how they vary with respect to each other. So when one goes up, does the other one go up or does it go down? Are they even related at all? Right? So you'll see something like this and it'll be all over the place often. But you can see maybe there's a kind of trend where as attribute one increases, attribute two increases. Right? Now this is a correlation being shown here, not a causation. So you can't say they're definitely related, but you can say that, generally speaking, when one is big, so is the other. Right? That's, that's like, sometimes useful. Right? A trend line is going to be where we're going to be plotting something over time. Right? So this has to be a continuous variable, or at least a variable we believe can be inferred between our points. Because right? it's unlikely that you're going to have all the points. So you, what you might have is you might have a plot where you've got time down here, so maybe time in months, for example, and we've got some you know, amount of something. And we're just going to plot it like this, and we can sort of have a trend line going like this. If it's a situation where we can infer the amount between two time points, then this is OK. Because right? we can say, well, look, we've got a reading here, we've got a reading here it's reasonable to assume that between these two points, this is the amount. Right? Nothing too funny has gone on between these two points. Right? If you can't assume that, then you shouldn't really be using a trend line. You probably want to be using a bar graph. Does that depend on the kind of data, then? Yes, it'll depend on the, this is a judgment call based on the kind of data. So if the data, I mean, time is a good, a good example. Right? We don't tend to measure sort of in infinitely small increments. We're going to be measuring daily or hourly or something like this. But we can kind of make an assumption a lot of the time that our readings like temperature, for example, over time, if you're at 20 and then the next hour you're at 25, we're probably halfway between the two, between those two times. Right? It's going to depend on your data. I mean, a good example would be if you were plotting something like operating system usage per student. So we've got OS X here, we've got Linux here, and we've got Windows. These many people use OS X, this many people use Linux, this many people use Windows. Well, these are discrete data points. You can't fit a trend line to these. There is no operating system that's 50% between Linux and Windows that I know of. Right? And we can't infer how many students are going to be using it. That makes no sense. That should be a bar chart. So let's look at an actual data set and see how we can use some of this visualization in practice. Right, so I've got here a chicken data set. 
And this data set is about weighing chickens on different diets over a period of weeks and also measuring how many eggs they produced. I'm not a farmer, but let's imagine that what we wanted to do was see if one of these uh, diets produces a better weight gain and maybe more eggs per week. Let's have a look. So I'm going to load the chicken data set. This is stored in a CSV, just like before. Let's have a quick look at just the first few rows of this data to see what they look like. So that's going to be the head function. And we can see we've got six attributes. So we've got the week that the measurement was taken, the chicken, in this case chicken number one, but there'll obviously be other chickens, um, the diet they're on, diet A, diet B or diet C, the age of a chicken in months, the weight of a chicken in kilograms, and the number of eggs they produce that week. Right? So there's going to be lots of combinations of weeks and chickens in this data set. Now, what we want to try and do is see if there's any kind of relationship between the diet they're on and the number of eggs they're producing, or the weight of a chicken, or anything like this. Right? So the first thing we could do is we could have a look at the aggregate function. So I'm going to paste this down here and we'll talk through it. What the aggregate function does is let us produce, let's say, a summary or calculate some means or medians over a data set, but this time grouping by a certain attribute. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to aggregate the weight of the chickens, but in groups of their diet, so all the A's, all the B's, and all the C's, and then we're going to, for each of those, we're going to calculate a summary. So let's run that, and you can see that we've got our group down here. For A, we've got the minimum, the maximum, the median, the mean, and we can see some slight differences perhaps in these data sets. I mean, the median and the mean, for example, of group A is 3.8, whereas the mean for group C is 3.4. So maybe there's a slight difference in these things. OK, so let's try a different aggregate function. So this time, we're going to aggregate the number of eggs produced, grouped by, again, the diet. So this is going to be all the A's, all the B's, and all the C's. And then we're going to produce a summary. So we can see that the median number of eggs produced for group A is 4 per week. And for group B and group C, it's 3 per week. So maybe, again, there's a slight difference. We're starting to learn a little bit about our data. So let's start with a histogram, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to use this histogram function, which is mostly labels, right? The hist function in R produces a histogram, and we're going to produce a histogram of the ages of the chickens. So what's the distribution of the ages? Are they old? Are they young? Um, and we're going to use 15 breaks. That means we're going to take the whole range and break it into 15 columns, 15 bands. Right? Now, actually, R will do a little bit of... Um, just a few checks behind the scenes to make sure 15 is an appropriate number and might adjust it up or down slightly. So we can see this histogram, broadly speaking, our chickens are evenly distributed among the different ages. We've got some young ones that are sort of 60 or 70 weeks old, older ones that are 350 weeks old. And then for some reason we've got a peak around 250. I don't know why that is, right? maybe we've got a batch of, of a certain age of chickens in. And let's finally, let's look at the box plot. So we talked about the box plot. Box plot will tell us the minimum, the maximum for an attribute, and also the median and the range. Right? So this is really helpful. So we're just going to have a look just to age, just for all chickens. So you can see that the median is around 220, something like that. And then the majority of the chickens, so 50% of the chickens, fall between about 150 weeks old and 300 weeks old. But you can see there are some very young ones and some very old ones. This kind of plot will let us really size up where our data sits before we start to make any assumptions. So let's imagine now that we wanted to try and drill down into this data a bit and work out whether actually the diet had any effect on the number of eggs or the weight of the chicken. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to group, uh, we're going to use the aggregate function again to calculate the means of all the weights per week. I'm just going to copy that down here. So we're going to say aggregate the weight of the chickens by both the week and the diet. So combinations so week one, diet A, week two, diet A, and so on. And I'm going to want you to calculate the mean for all chickens. So uh, we'll run that. So that produces some statistics on the different average weight of chickens over time. I'm going to rename the columns so that they're a little bit more informative. All right, so we'll run that line there. And then finally, we're going to plot this. Now, we're going to use ggplot for this. You know, whether you use the inbuilt R plot functions or another library like ggplot will kind of depend on what plot you want to do. In general, you can get quite nice plots with ggplot, but they're a little bit more involved. All right, so I'm going to run this line here. And looking at this data, we can kind of see that maybe diet A is having a positive effect, right? So down at the bottom, when no weeks have passed at the beginning of our experiment, they're all roughly the same weight. And then the average weight of A actually does seem to increase. So I guess that's something interesting about our data. Right. Now let's look at number of eggs. Right. So we're going to do the same thing. This time we're going to aggregate the number of eggs by week and by diet. So we're going to copy that and I'm going to give it some helpful labels as well. And then we're going to plot the data. Let's see over time whether or not any of the diets have any effect on the eggs. And it's looking pretty good. Right. So 
This is the frequency is the number of eggs we're producing, the weeks is the 12 weeks of our experiment, and you can see that diet B and diet C produce roughly the same number of eggs per week. Right? This is averaged over all the chickens. But diet A produces at least an egg more per week on average. You know, that's a 20% increase, roughly speaking, if you're, if you're a farmer, that's a great thing. Right? But the, the problem we've got is that this might be a little bit too good to be true. What we're seeing here is perhaps an issue of correlation versus causation. So we can see here that there is a correlation between the diet that's being used and the number of eggs, but we don't know that it's the diet specifically that causes it. So we're going to look in more detail at the ages of the chickens specifically, because I'm interested to know in whether or not, for example, older chickens produce more or fewer eggs, right? Because that could be relevant to our, to our experiment. Okay, so we're going to group the chickens up by diet and then work out what their average age is, so mean age. Right, so I'm going to calculate this, run this here, and then I'm going to look at it. And we can see that the average age, the mean age for group A, or the chickens on diet A, is only 156 weeks. But the age for, let's say, group C is 248 weeks. That's significantly older. Right? So we need to just check that this isn't going to be an issue for the number of eggs laid. So let's plot the number of eggs versus the age of the chickens. Right? So here we're going to generate a scatter plot of age versus the number of eggs, but we're also going to colour by diet so we can see roughly where the different diets sit. So let's run this. Okay, so what we can see is that actually as chickens get older, we do see a quite serious decrease in the number of eggs produced per week from about four and a half average down to about, I don't know, two and a half or two average, right? And also we can see that diet A is predominantly sitting up here, which means that the chickens are younger. So this could be a problem. What we're saying is that it could be that we happen to have put a load of young chickens on diet A, and yes, they're producing more eggs, but that isn't because of diet A, that's because they're younger. Right? So let's have a look at a box plot of the age of chickens per diet, and you can see that they're significantly younger on diet A. So I think the conclusion we can draw is that it's theoretically possible that there's a link between the diet and the number of eggs produced, but we can't really say it from this data. We're gonna need a lot more data, maybe some, uh, you know, some more chickens right, to try and work this out. We've seen a number of different visualizations, and the important thing is that we use visualizations appropriately and we don't make assumptions about our data. So we're going to start to look at uh, cleaning of data and then maybe using our data in clustering and classification. Um, but visualization is a really good way to start off exploring your data and generate some initial hypotheses. Well, we're looking at chocolate uh, data sets today, so I thought I'd bring some research. Um, Mm. Good? Yeah, good and definitely relevant.